Thank you, Joshua. Well, I would like to um, um, thank several people, and of course, Joshua Bell is one of them because you know this project is um, um, is a um, fruitful collaboration between between Josh and I. But uh, I would also like to thank the people of the Trobian Islands, Kamato Kis, Minakili Villa, Pela, Sinalo Kupila, Segu, Pela, Manakwa, Mapaisiwas. So I'm going to talk about this uh, project, which is an ongoing project that started in 2011. Um, with uh, one particular collection in the National um, Archives here at the Smithsonian. And uh, I would like to, um, it's a very, very um, rich, I have a very rich material, it's, a, um, it's an ongoing project. So I would like you, I'm actually going to encourage you to interrupt me with questions if you have any, uh, so that we make it a little bit more interesting and it's not just me talking and I'm expecting that you may have um, questions. but. Uh, Basically, um, the, um, the goals of the project, you know, when, we, uh, when, when I started looking at this collection in the, um, the archives were um, uh, the integration of knowledge associated to um, the repatriated objects. Um, and in particular, the, one of the research questions was what happens when um, the objects are actually in material um, stories and uh, how the recovered voices of a particular collection can recirculate as repatriated objects and what type of knowledge um, is in them. So one of the main questions that this, this project um, asks is what, what, is this, what does this knowledge look like? Um, and the, difference, the different forms that this type of knowledge can take, um, especially when we're talking about um, a, an oral culture like the Trobian Islands culture that is slowly switching uh, towards literacy. And uh, one of the things that uh, uh, came out when I repatriated this collection, as you will see um, hopefully throughout the presentation, is what do these voices tell us? Um, what can we learn from immaterial cultural heritage and immaterial cultural ex expressions? There is a 2003 UNESCO convention that uh, gives a definition that I think is quite um, um, to the point so as to what is um, intangible cultural heritage and it is a quote oral traditions and expressions traditional craftsmanship performing arts rituals and festivals knowledge and practices concerning nature and the universe and social practices of a particular place so what i'm hoping is that throughout this presentation uh, all these all these uh, types of uh, um, immaterial cultural heritage would resurface and you'd be able to see the different connections between these different types of knowledge and what, what can museums um, get from this type of collaborations but also what can source communities get from um, these type of partnerships. So, this is a, a list of the project goals uh, when I first um, saw the collection and uh, it basically um, Go, you know, it goes down to these, um, to these um, um, four points. Uh, of course, the first one was to um, uh, research the collection proper, and I'm going to give you some information about the collection um, soon. Uh, and soon enough, when I was, when I was working with the collection, we realized that uh, what actually made sense was to take this collection back. I mean, it doesn't matter how much work I put into researching a collection in the archives, if it's just me looking at it with my more or less limited knowledge of traveling culture, there's only so much um, I can get from the collection. And of course, there's never going to be a revitalization of the um, cultural practices that are embedded and the knowledge that is embedded in this, in this collection. Uh, this is the Trobian Islands. Um, I'm assuming that I'm speaking to a more or less knowledgeable uh, audience when it comes to anthropology. And the Trobian Islands, of course, are one of the um, one of the most um, well-known places in anthropology. So you get an idea of uh, where the Trobian Islands are um, on the east on the eastern side of um, Papua New Guinea. And. Um, let me give you some information about the um, collection um, proper. The collection is called the Jerry, um, it's listed as a Jerry W. Leach Trobian Folklore Collection. Uh, it's kept in the um, sound recording section of the National Anthropological Archives. It consists of um, 34 magnetic um, audio tapes and uh, that has been turned into 20 folders. Um, it's quite sizable. 
that have the transcribed and translated um, narratives of the collection. The narratives proper are uh, 365 in number. Um, they are uh, split, they're listed as being either Liliu, which are uh, foundation myths in the Chobin Islands, or Kukwanebu, which are folk tales. The large majority of them are folk tales. Um, there are only around 20, 26 um, Liliu uh, f um, myths. And uh, of the whole collection, only 305 uh, transcriptions and translations have survived. The rest uh, is missing, presumably at the uh, National Library at the University of Papua New Guinea. Um, even though uh, when I tried to look that up, there were no records there. So it may as well be that they were never transcripted or translated. But um, nonetheless, it's quite sizable. Um, the 20 folders um, are more or less about they occupy this space in a trolley, so it's it's uh, it's a lot of uh, pages. As you can see, um, some of the myths and the stories are one page long. Some are up to 116, which is quite a lot. The collection also has other elements, um, like the Yosokana jokes, which are really popular in the Trobin Islands, and I hope I'll have a chance to um, talk about those as well. There are 11 songs that haven't been transcribed nor um, translated. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about those as well. And uh, there's some uh, um, additional material. There are um, some types of the um, uh, recordings of the um, proceeding of the first school of conference that took place in Cambridge at King's College in 1978. And there are also some uh, loose pages in the last folder that contain some uh, uh, magic spells from the Trobin Islands known as Megwa. And uh, this is what the um, collection looks like. So, as you can see, these are the transcriptions. Uh, basically, it gives a, um, more or less the, the, uh, the key information for every single myth, which is the author or the storyteller, the village where they come from, uh, their gender, their, um, their age, um, when it was recorded, and the number of pages. And then there is, you know, before the story proper, there's a little, um, there's a little space for comments that the, um, the people who did the transcriptions and translations uh, give on the, on the story, on each story. Uh, then you have the story proper in uh, Kilivila, which is a, a vernacular language of the Trobin Islands. And every sentence is numbered so that you can easily find the translation that follows sentence by sentence. So it's a very exhaustive um, work. Uh, most stories towards the end have some sort of lexicon or little dictionary or comments where basically the, trans the person who did the transcription or the translation tries to clarify some passages. And it can be either an obscure expression that is, um, that is hard to um, translate in English, or at times it can be the name of a place that you know, cannot be identified in you know, names of objects or sometimes names of people. Um, so there's already um, this, this type of information that has been incorporated in some of the stories. And very few, probably like 10 or 12 of them, have also some illustrations um, that we don't know exactly who made them. Maybe um, Jerry can tell us more about this. But this gives you an idea of what the collection um, looks like. And uh, this gives you an idea of uh, the collector, which is this um, fine gentlemen uh, that uh, we have the privilege to have in the audience with us. Um, Jerry Leach is surrounded by some of the students at uh, the University of Papua New Guinea who helped him um, with this project. So Jerry Leach is a very well-known figure if you're an anthropology student uh, because you may have heard of uh, Trouble and Cricket, of course, but, but Jerry's achievements go beyond the making of this seminal documentary. Jerry um, also organized a conference, the first Kula conference in uh, Cambridge, as I've mentioned. And he was an instrumental person in helping uh, um, setting up the University of Papua New Guinea right prior to the independence of the country in 1978, uh, 75, sorry. So Jerry arrived in Port Moresby in 69, and through his effort, he, um, he helped set up the um, Department of Anthropology. And he was, he was um, one of the um, educators of the very first generation, uh, generation of, um, of um, Papua New Guineans who were educated in, in their own country right after independence. Um, 
these are some slides that uh, um, Jerry took in, in the 1970s, early 1970s, of him um, <coughs> collecting the, the stories. So these are, very, um, these are very useful in terms of tracing the history of the collection and the history of the histories and how the, um, how the collection was made. Um, you can identify people in the photos. So for instance, um, these are the captions that uh, um, Jerry gave me. But uh, it's very likely that the gentleman you can see on the right that is telling a story is actually uh, Tolosi from Labai. Tolosi is a, um, was um, a very famous storyteller and a key figure in, in uh, the Trobian society because he was the keeper of uh, what is said to be the uh, place of origin of all the metric lands of the Trobian Islands. And as such, he was very knowledgeable. He knew the myths, the founding myths of every single clan. So there are several stories by Tolosi in um, a leech collection that are um, fundamental if you want to trace the origins of these of these um, particular myths. And uh, this is um, the team, the, um, the the team that translated the uh, collection, transcribed and translated the collection back at UPNG. So as you can see, it was a fairly um, analogical affair back then. Of course, no digital. Help. So they had to listen to the same tape and same recording again and again, and send it back. It was uh, I was told by some of the people in the Chobin Islands who um, who are still alive who worked on this project that it was a very tedious thing to do to listen to the same thing and transcribe it and translate it. So what they actually the way they split it was somebody would do the transcription but not the translation of the same story. So you you could actually get a break and move on and do something a little bit different. So you that in that way you could also check what you know, your colleague have done in terms of transcription or translation. And um, this is just to show you that, you know, some of, some of these people um, who helped um, Jerry, um, of course, are still alive and went on to becoming uh, prominent figures in, in the Trobin Islands and sometimes beyond. This uh, gentleman here is Gerald Bayona who at the time uh, was doing his uh, degree at the University of Papua New Guinea. And uh, Jerry shortly after uh, went on to um, um, becoming a member of parliament for um, uh, Kiruna Gurinov electorate. And to date, he's been the longest serving uh, member of parliament for that electorate. He won three elections in a row. Uh, he became minister of education as well. So he was definitely a key figure, not only in the Trobin Islands, but also in, in Papua New Guinea. And as you can see, he's back in the village and he's very happy um, um, looking after his yam garden. So this is a little bit to, gi um, to give you a little idea about the preliminary work um, that I started in 2011 uh, when I started looking at the collection. Um, the first thing, of course, was to read the material and try to assess what was there and classify the collection. So, of course, I'm not the first one to look at uh, Trobian myths, uh, neither is Jerry. Uh, Malinowski beat us all in these, um, as usual. And uh, he attempted a classification of the, the Trobian, uh, Trobian narrative. So, he did this classification, but uh, uh, sure enough, it's, it's not a clear cut classification. It's actually very, very difficult by Trobian standards to, to give a clear cut classification of every single narrative. So despite the fact that, of course, there are Wasi songs and there are Dittis and there is magic, um, it's very hard to try to establish those as, as um, even though they are part of narratives, it's very hard to establish those as being um, uh, sort of self-standing stories or myths. They are part of myths, but they definitely don't constitute a, a separate, um, a separate um, type of narrative in that. Uh, so Leach attempted, um, Jerry attempted a, a different classification that I think is more accurate in terms of splitting the collection into folk tales and um, myths. So heading on towards the uh, repatriation proper, um, which is basically <coughs> taking the collection back to the Trobin Islands. There were three, three main uh, things that this project uh, was, trying to, uh, was trying to do. First of all, the, um, the first thing was try to contextualize the collection. Uh, so basically, um, I took the collection back and I did some, like, a series of public talks with the people in different communities explaining what it is that I was bringing back uh, and 
what it is that I was expecting to hear uh, from them. So um, we tried to get information on the storytellers and that was fairly successful because everybody knew who the storytellers were or are in the cases when um, they're still alive. Um, we tried to establish what the story is about in terms of what, what, is, what is the story behind the story, uh, reading in between lines, what does the story tell us, um, where does it originate. Some of these stories are, uh, pertain only to the Trobin Islands, but as you can imagine, these stories circulate widely in the whole area. So some stories come, actually come from other islands and are repeated you know, throughout generations because they were exchanged, uh, they were exchanged during a Kula trip or, or through intermarriages between different, uh, uh, different clans in different islands. Uh, perhaps the most important bit of information concerning the stories was um, trying to understand the context in which this story would have been told originally. And by this I don't mean when it was told to Jerry, but you know, like where does this story come from in terms of why would somebody tell this story to an audience and what, what is this story? So this probably gave us a more uh, um, accurate idea of a possible classification in Trobian terms of the stories. So when it comes to myths, for instance, there are several, there are at least two different types of myths, but the, uh, by far the most important one is the myths that recount, uh, that recount the genealogy of the different clans. So people emerge in the Trobin Islands from a um, common place of origin, which is Obukula Cave, and the first ancestor started working around the island. And this gives um, an account of the landmarks, of the things that the first ancestor did, the landmarks, uh, why does this land belong to this maternal clan. And this is a very sensitive um, um, information because you have land disputes in the Trobin Islands like you do in many other places. And the only way to uh, settle these disputes is to recount your own story and your own genealogy. So in a way these myths are power. And because of that it became fairly clear um, very early on in the project when I took the collection back that the myths that uh, Jerry had collected were incomplete. The reason for this is that nobody really wants to give all this information, all this power to not, not just to a Western anthropologist, but to anybody really. This is uh, very sensitive information that is, that is kept secret. So what we have actually are very sort of um, um, summary accounts of, of the whole myth, which is much, much longer. But nonetheless, it is interesting in terms of establishing you know, the, different, the different places of origin um, of different, different clans, the different Mati clans in, in the um, Trobian Islands. And not only that, but also like origin, you know, the, um, um, the origin of different magic spells that are still widely um, used in the Trobian Islands um, and other sorts of uh, more or less sensitive information. Um, another thing that we tried to do was to um, um, elucidate more, um, uh, more accurately um, the stories and what, you know, what, what does the story mean, but also what are some elements in the story that are obscure mean. So we found that uh, there were many um, expressions that were untranslated by the students in Port Moresby at the time. Uh, we tried to find the meaning for these expressions. Some are um, just old ways of talking that are getting lost, um, that people no longer use. Uh, some are names of places um, that are not in the Trobin Islands, so only older people who have traveled beyond the Trobin Islands in the context of traditional exchange uh, journeys know what these uh, words um, mean. Uh, some are the names of objects or of, um, animal or plant species that again, you know, like young people, young generations uh, don't know. So that, th that's also like a um, um, some sort of knowledge that we, we, you know, we recovered, so to speak, when repatriating the collection and discussing it with, um, with local people. And um, the next step was to make a selection. I mean, the collection, as you've seen, is huge. There's uh, um, more than 300 stories. And uh, the idea we had um, when talking about, um, you know, uh, the repatriation project with Josh was to um, make a book, to make a book with these, um, with these myths and to take the book back to the Trobin Islands. But to do so, we needed to make a selection. And uh, we didn't want this book to be an anthropology uh, a manual or an anthropology book, so to speak. Uh, we wanted it to be some sort of didactic tool for the school teachers in the Trobin Islands to teach about the cultural heritage um, 
of the, of the Chobin Islands. Um, the education system in Papua New Guinea uh, establishes that only the first two years of elementary school are taught in the vernacular language, and I think even that has been changed now. And from then onwards, education is in English. This is a country where there's 800 plus languages, so there needs to be some sort of um, cohesive element, and of course, when it comes to education, that is English. But what, what that means is that many of the school teachers come from other provinces, and when they teach you know, their um, um, syllabus, they often refer to examples that do not pertain to the place where they're teaching. So with this book, what we're trying to achieve is that the students in the Chobin Islands get to know a little bit more about their own culture, not just through the families and through the parents and through um, storytelling, but also at school. So we decided that it was, it was up to the people in the Tropic Islands to make a selection of the stories um, that they wanted to be in this book. And um, it was a matter of assessing why are these stories, <coughs> excuse me, why are these stories important um, and what are the elements that can be linked to the story that, are, that go beyond, beyond the narrative proper. So one of the immediate effects of uh, the repatriation process was, uh, was that there was, there was a sudden interest in a practice that uh, somehow has been lost. Um, this is a place where there's no electricity. Um, only recently mobile phones have arrived to the Tropic Islands. And uh, nowadays people like watching films. Uh, so there's no longer, there's no longer the storytelling uh, um, um, interest that there used to be um, when, when Jerry was there and up until probably the 1990s. But when I brought the collection back, more and more people kept on coming to me and asking me for the printouts of the stories and the myths because they wanted to read them. They wanted to take them back to the villages and uh, read them aloud to, um, to their um, uh, relatives and to their friends in the villages. So the printouts started circulating uh, more widely than, than I had um, anticipated. And this was good because I had more and more people coming back to me and telling me, well, you know, I've read this story and look, there's something missing. And uh, this, you know, this expression uh, is badly translated, you know, in your translation, it actually means something else. And this is important because it tells us about the um, hunger foods that we can harvest when there is a drought, for instance. So through this more or less like spontaneous circulation, we managed to um, gather more, um, more knowledge. Um, and uh, the, interest in, uh, the interest of people in the Chobin Islands in listening to these stories is by no means is, is, um, um, is new. As you can see, this is a slide from Jerry, and this is back in 1973. And uh, people are just playing some of the recordings that had just um, um, taken and I think, I believe this is Jerry's house up in Kaibola village. And people are just sitting around and listening, listening to these stories. So this is, this, is not a, this is not a new thing. But there were some unexpected uh, um, consequences that perhaps we hadn't anticipated in the project. And one was uh, having people coming to, um, to me and asking to record an alternative version because they thought theirs was better or they thought like there was something uh, key missing in the recorded version. So, through this repatriation, we actually managed to collect more stories. Um, and uh, we also collected um, other types of material, including songs and dances that were linked to the stories. And uh, um, below, I mean, in the caption, you can see there's a, there's a very small classification of some of these um, songs and dances. There are way more than those, but because people heard about, um, you know, because some of these practices are mentioned in some of the stories, they wanted me to uh, record some of those. And I don't know if you'll hear it okay, but I'll play you like a little. <laughs> Oh, 
That's um, actually a dirge that is sung on the occasion of a uh, death. So it's actually sung by mostly by women uh, during the uh, wake um, of the corpse. And uh, it is highly narrative in the sense that uh, uh, what the person singing does is to um, enumerate the qualities of the deceased person and their relation to them. And uh, uh, how I came to know about this is because this practice is mentioned in one of the stories in the collection. So when talking, when discussing this, people felt like they had to give me an example of what is this and, and, and how it's done and why is it, why is it important. Um, but there were other things that uh, um, we discovered in the process of uh, uh, doing the repatriation. And uh, one is the uh, uh, Bigivakala proverbs, and the other one is the string figures known as Caninicula. And again, I put this quote here by uh, Gunther Semt, who's a researcher who's been doing a lot of work in the Trabian Islands for the past 30 years. Uh, the could be misleading because he claims that there's no such thing as proverbs uh, in the Trobin Islands. Uh, well, there are <laughs> I collected over a hundred proverbs in, in less than three months and there are way more. But this is, just to, this is just to prove that it's very difficult, even if you work in the same place for a long time, it's very difficult if you don't have a, um, uh, if you don't have a cue like I did have with a leech collection, you may sometimes not be able to elicit all the information you need that pertains to that particular culture. So I found there was a, um, there was a wealth of uh, proverbs and sayings that um, were partly included, some of which were partly included in, in, the, um, in the Leech collection. And there were also some uh, Vina Vina Ditis uh, and some Caninicola string figures. Uh, unfortunately, the string figures are really hard to, um, um, to recover, so to speak, because there are very, very few people who remember how to make them. Uh, but I was told that it was a, um, and there's some evidence um, of it in, in Marinovsky, that it was a very, very common practice, uh, especially um, amongst women. So we may have been late to recover that, but there were other things that uh, um, we managed to um, salvage, so to speak. and. Uh, Another, um, another thing that I did when I took, when I repatriated the um, um, Leach collection was to take back some photographs from the Fitzpatrick collection. James Fitzpatrick uh, was an Australian uh, doctor who carried out a nutrition survey in 1947 in Papua New Guinea. He went around several places, uh, including the Trobian Islands. Uh, he shot a very short documentary and uh, he took um, lots of photographs. So taking this collection back also allowed us to, um, together with the um, Trabian people, allowed us to put together the photographs and some of the stories. So for instance, there's a story in which uh, there, is a, um, um, there is an enumeration of the different types of stingrays that uh, the people in one particular village uh, hunt and eat. And it's all, it only happens in this village in Wetaru because otherwise it's considered to be a taboo food. So this actually allowed us to identify not only the people in the, in the photograph, but also some uh, nutrition habits. Um, and the photo on the right is the ritual presentation of a type of fish that is only consumed by the paramount chief and his matrilineage in the Trabian Islands. So again, this is a type of information that we couldn't, you know, we, we couldn't find elsewhere, despite the fact that many researchers have done fieldwork in the Trabian Islands. Um, but now I would like to give you some examples of other, um, all the sorts of intersections between the material and the uh, immaterial. And I want to talk about Imdiduya, which is a, a, a folk tale, a famous folk tale from the Trobian Islands. Um, in the Leech collection, it's actually the longest, the longest one. It has 116 pages. It was told by Sebwaga, which was probably the most famous uh, storyteller in the Trobin Islands at the time. He's still well remembered nowadays. Uh, so much so that uh, um, Les McLaren did a documentary just on him in 1978 called Kamawosi, Our Songs. Um, 
And this is a this is a cool uh, epic. Uh, it's, a, it's a love story between this man who keeps on dreaming about a woman who lives in a distant island, and he's never seen this woman. And he sets off to travel um, in his canoe to find this woman and marry her. And uh, at the end, uh, he ends up going back to his own island. Uh, there's a tragic ending. Um, but this was the inspiration uh, not only for, uh, for Seb Wagar to tell his story and for uh, um, Jerry to publish it, but um, uh, John Kasebolova, who is a key figure as well in Trubian, in Trubian politics and in national politics, he started a micro-independence movement in 1975 called Kavisa Wali, uh, which was actually uh, um, the subject of uh, Jerry's PhD thesis at the time while he was doing his research in the Trubian Islands. Uh, John Casabolova commissioned a series of panels to go together with a folk opera that he wrote called Sail the Midnight Sun, which is basically um, based on this, on this myth, on the myth of Imdeluya. And these panels were carved under the direction of um, this man here to the left called Yobuta and uh, Valos. He was another uh, famous Trogan carver who taught in the National Art School in Port Moresby. In Port, Port Moresby. Uh, they're both still alive, and uh, they carved 14 panels that are now at the National Gallery of Victoria. The making of these storyboards and these panels is by no means a uh, Trabian tradition, but this is just so that you can see how something that is not traditional can become something traditional, uh, in this case through storytelling and intersections between the oral and the written, or in this case the oral and the, and the visual. So ever since uh, Yobuta carved this panel, there's been other people who have taken up this new tradition of um, mm, carving uh, storyboards and telling a story in a, in a visual way. So this is a panel that was carved um, by um, Yobuta as well in 2010 and Laudine Dine is a story um, that is um, also in, in the Leech collection. Uh, but the fortunes of this um, of this uh, particular um, myth, the sail the midnight sun or in the Duya, are ongoing. So last year, on the occasion of an international conference uh, on Malinowski, the uh, these two carvers uh, started making a new series of panels um, to be kept in the um, um, in the National Museum in Port Moresby, or perhaps in a, a newly founded um, cultural foundation that is that is in Alota. So this is, as you can see, this is an ongoing dialogue between the material and the material between this famous myth and you know this uh, newly created tradition of making storyboards in the Trobian Islands. Uh, Another example of this materialization of stories um, is the Botalu stool. So Botalu is a village in the eastern coast and the western coast of uh, the Trobin Islands. And in, 19, in the 1920s, 1930s, the wife of a missionary who was established in, in the Trobin Islands convinced local carvers to start making pieces of furniture because she claimed that this would sell really well among the community of expatriates. And so much so that you know, Trobinders and um, Botalans are still making these these carvings for sale. Now these are very um, very beautiful and intricate carvings, but uh, uh, they're not part of the traditional pool of um, Trobin carvings, so to speak, who tend to be abstract and non-figurative. Nonetheless, they are very um, very well liked, and and it, um, they allow the uh, people in Botalu village to to get some cash income. But perhaps because they haven't really been studied, um, very little is known about uh, the motifs that are carved in these tools. So what happened during the repatriation project is that um, I found a very convincing explanation for this uh, particular motif that is employed in the uh, stools and tables, which is, as you can see, a dog holding a head. Now, when I took one of the stories back to um, Buetalo, which is um, this village, and the story, I took it back there because the, the, the story is called To Buetalo, which is a man from Buetalo, uh, people actually made this connection that uh, um, I had failed to make and everybody else had failed to make, uh, which basically, you can see it um, um, summarized um, under there. But uh, in this story, these two giant ogres that feature in almost every single myth in the Trobin Islands, 
are followed by these dogs, are hunted by these dogs, and they, um, they hang on to these uh, gargoyle-like poles, ridge poles, that are built in trodden huts until the dogs get them and, and eat them. So people told me, well, this is why we make these carvings, because you know, this is one of the stories that is actually from Wetalwen, not from somewhere else in the Trobin Islands. So this allowed me to make yet another interesting connection between one of these ridge poles, um, Mwamwala, uh, and some older versions of it. So the one you can see on the right, it's in a, a collection of the Museum of Anthropology and Ethnology in Florence. And uh, it's just listed as a figure. There's very, very little information. But through the repatriation and through this particular story, we managed to identify it as an old version of um, this uh, um, gargoyle, Mwamwala, that is still built in, in Trobian huts. And as you can see, it's, uh, it's, it's a much better carving, so to speak. It's, you know, it has more details. And uh, it fulfills a, a, an apotropaic function, so basically it prevents uh, evil spirits from entering the house. So this is just to give you an example. Um, there, are, there are many others, uh, but I'm running out of time. But this is just to mention, this is a contemporary carving that is based on Dokani Kani, which is this ogre that features prominently in, in Trojan folklore. And again, this is a fairly recent thing. People up until very recently were not carving these representative figures. But perhaps, I don't want to say be because of the repatriation, but perhaps because of the recirculation of these myths and the retelling of these stories, people are going back to, um, or not going back, but you know, like they're inventing like new forms of, um, of representation. Uh, even though some are not that new, these are old, old carvings of um, spirits. And again, identifying uh, the types of spirits and what spirits um, these are is, on, is, only, um, is only possible if you have some old myths and some folk tales that actually give you some clues as to what these represent. But uh, I want to um, tell you a little bit more about the book. Um, that would be the next, um, the next step in, uh, in a process after the repatriation of the collection. So um, people in the Trojan Islands made a selection of around 100 stories that they think are the most crucial ones to represent the culture. So we'll have uh, um, stories first in Kiriwina, in the local language, with a um, translation in English on the next page. We'll have a little blurb uh, at the beginning of the story. So we have the name of the story uh, with the original numbering from the Leech collection, uh, the name of the storyteller, uh, storyteller and uh, a little blurb. We'll have some, uh, um, for those stories that have some relevant <coughs> vocabulary, some explanations so as to what um, to these words um, mean. Uh, we have a distinction between the folk tales and the Liliu myths. So that one was told by Tolosi, who was the gatekeeper um, that you've seen in that photo, um, by Jerry Leach in, uh, in Obukula Cave. And uh, as I said before, these myths are not, they're not exhaustive. They don't, they don't really list all the, all the uh, crucial elements of the myth. But they give you an idea of you know, what, what every single uh, matric clan, uh, what the place of origin of every single matric, matric clan is. Um, we'll have some illustrations that um, um, give examples of the objects that are mentioned in the stories. So this is a photo from uh, um, the collections here at the Smithsonian. Um, so the name of this story is Bolu and it mentions these, um, this type of water containers that is made out of uh, uh, coconuts that of course is no longer made in the Trojan Islands. Uh, and this is another uh, possible illustration. This is a painting by Martin Morobubuna, um, who was a, a famous Trojan painter. He's living in Port Moresby. And um, at first, he was going to collaborate with a um, project. He was going to do the illustrations for the book. But sadly, he uh, passed in 2014. So we're not going to be able to, um, to have his illustrations. Um, and this is another illustration of a type of a particular type of yam house that was built in Labai that you know um, is no longer um, existing, and the particularity is that it was it was built on a single pole, and it could actually swing with the wind. Now this is a very um, 
high symbolism and uh, it's uh, it's really unfortunate that we don't have it anymore but you know it's through the through the repatriation of the collection and the making of the book uh, people are going to uh, have a memory of it and people are going to be able to at least uh, conceptualize what it looks like and perhaps in the near future you know it can also um, be um, rebuilt the book will contain uh, two appendixes perhaps more but you know at, at the time um, right now we're thinking of two types of appendixes one is uh, um, uh, contains animal animal species and the other one has botanical species so we'll have a photograph of each of them um, the story or the myth uh, where it's mentioned and the uses that are that are given to um, either the botanical species or, or the, um, the animal species um, And uh, this, uh, um, this again is an, an example of you know the, um, the illustrations of the um, of the appendixes. And in this particular case, what it does, it, it tells us a little bit um, more about fishing techniques and the material culture associated to um, these these, um, these fishing um, techniques. So just to conclude uh, very quickly, um, I think it's important to acknowledge the fact that. Uh, um, Oral culture, and in this particular case, um, Trobian tales extend beyond words, and they materialize the many voices uh, that originate them into into actions, into songs, into dances, into objects that actually form the cultural breadth of the Trobian society. Uh, Trobian society is often portrayed as being resilient. It's it's often portrayed as the main characteristic of the Trobian Islands because many years after Malinowski was there. Uh, researchers keep on going back and they keep on finding pretty much the same things. But I think if, if we have to stress something about Trovian culture more than its resiliency, I think uh, we should talk about uh, how dynamic this culture, this culture is. So it's not, about, um, it's not just about preservation of past knowledge, but I think it's more about acknowledging the changing ways of, of knowing. Uh, Perhaps the most touching thing about this whole repatriation project was that um, I realized how Trabinders themselves uh, realize the need to transmit those elements in the culture that make up the Trabinders, so to speak. So I had people coming up to me saying, you know, if only I had a tape recorder, I could tape these people who, you know, who compose these songs and, you know, and they're going to die soon and I think we need to preserve these or people who would like to um, recall the making of canoes, the different types of canoes and the different techniques and the different carvings that are, that are um, um, employed in the Trobin Islands. Again, for the same reason, because uh, uh, um, the last master carvers were still alive, are getting old and they're not gonna be able to pass on this knowledge. So I think what, there are, um, what people are actually admitting is not their um, need to, um, sorry, is the need to, uh, to uh, learn and transmit what they've learned, which is incidentally what uh, museums also um, do. So I think repatriation projects um, on that note need to, uh, need to meet in those common grounds uh, as learning processes both for the communities and you know, for, the, for the museums. So that's more or, less, more or less it. Thank you very much. Um, well, of course, everybody has their favorite, and you know that sometimes just goes down to just taste, right? But um, but some stories, you know, um, everybody agreed on the fact that you know this is important for the future generations to know. So if you're talking about the origin myth of a particular crop like taro, that is tantamount to the survival, to the physical survival of people, then they they all agree that you know we need to preserve this story. Uh, some, some stories are well known and they have a very wide circulation uh, in the Trobin Islands and beyond. And sometimes it's not because of the um, key information that is sort of like uh, embedded in the story. Sometimes it's just it's, it, because it's a funny story. So there's a, there's a very famous one that Malinowski already released. It's the story of a louse and a butterfly. Uh, that one everybody agreed that now this is, you know, this is a very Trobin story. We need to have this one. Uh, 
Another one is, for instance, the, uh, the uh, origin myth for a fire, you know, how fire came to be in the island and how it was used for uh, cooking food that before that was consumed raw. So I think there was, there was wide agreement. Uh, what, I, what I actually did is like I had several copies of the same story. I printed them out while I was there. So I circulated those. And when they get back to me, as you may have seen in one of the slides, it says good story. These are, peop these are comments that people actually wrote themselves. So if the same story was labeled as being a good story by more than one person, then we would discuss it again. We say like, is this a good story? You agree like this is a good story and why so? So I mean, we still have, you know, we still have some disagreement. There were still some, uh, um, some stories that we thought like I personally thought were interesting uh, because of the influence of missionaries, uh, some of the stories that have more sort of like eschatological um, themes or more sexual, overtly sexual the uh, themes uh, were kind of ruled out, not by everybody, but by some people who were concerned about um, the morality of the story and whether it's appropriate for school children to hear about this story. I mean, school children already know about these things. <laughs> So it's, I think it's a, uh, I think it's a pointless um, apprehension. But nonetheless, I mean the, you know the the, the important thing, the, the backbone of the project is actually to respect, you know the um, the local people's selections, the community selection when it comes to this. So there were some stories that I particularly really liked that you know people say no, we, you, you cannot include this. So. It's well, I think um, I think I have an idea. Uh, and I don't know if this is entirely accurate, but uh, John Kaseborova, who was a mastermind, one of the masterminds behind the Kabisawali movement, at the time was a student at UPNG, and he was in touch with other um, sort of micro-independence leaders from all over Papua New Guinea uh, in Port Moresby. Uh, it is not a tribal tradition, that of storyboards, but it is a SIPIC tradition. You have you have storyboards in the SIPIC that predate the Trobian ones. Now, my hypothesis is that John Kasebolova saw these storyboards in Port Moresby, and he, when he went back to the Trobian Islands, he instructed, he's not a carver himself, he doesn't know how to carve, even though he was given the magic of carving by his uncle. But he instructed people, including um, Yobuta, that um, a carver who made those panels, on how to make these panels. So it's, it's kind of a new tradition, if you wish. It's an invented tradition that starts for the Trobian Islands in the 1970s. I'm curious if the, if the whole return process, if you get to the process, if you Well, first of all, people were really, really grateful, so to speak, that this thing, this, this collection and these stories were preserved somewhere and that they, you know, they were brought back to the community because, I mean, being oral, oral narratives, you know, if it wasn't because of um, Lich's um, um, efforts, uh, they would have been lost. Maybe not all of them because some are really popular and people still remember some of those and, and the, you know, the, the, the proof of that is that people came to me and they told me different versions. But some, some, um, some of the myths and some of the stories that um, were in the uh, collection even, even uh, the most knowledgeable elders in the community confessed that they hadn't heard about or they only knew a little bit about, but they didn't know all the details. So I think people acknowledge the fact that you know, having an institution that can actually preserve you know, this knowledge and this material is great. But I think even more importantly, what, you know, what they, um, they saw the role of the museum as a like the potential possible role of the museum was to sponsor some sort of like storytelling revival. They said, well, you know, this is great, but you know, like what would be even better is um, if, you know, like you or the museum could actually sponsor a storytelling competition. So in that way, we could get this, the best storytellers of the island come over and, you know, for the next three or four days, they could tell the, they could tell the stories or we'll have a jury and people would say, okay, well, these are the best storytellers and these are the best stories. Now, the, the role of the storyteller in, in, in Trobian society, of course, now has been downplayed because of the arrival of new media, but it was a, it was a key one. The storyteller is a poet. It's, it's a bit like in the classic, classic world. 
So, you know, um, people, people take this concoction and this special magic when they want to become a storyteller, which is slightly different from the magic that somebody who wants to be a singer or a dancer takes. And what this magic does to you is like it opens up your mind so you can receive things and it helps you memorize things. Because, I mean, let's not forget that all of this was, was, was possible in a traditional context because people were able to memorize. And sometimes, like Sebwagao himself, like this famous storyteller, you know, like the story of him, Deduya, you know, the transcription is 116 pages. I mean, this is, an, this, is, this is an epic story, right? And, you know, he was able to memorize this. And they have to memorize names of places, uh, names of people. And sometimes it's places and people they don't even know. Uh, one thing that I, that I discovered uh, recently, I mean, when I, last time I was in, in Papua New Guinea, I traveled to Buriburi, which is another group of islands that lies some 300 miles to the east of the Troban Islands. They speak an Austronesian language that is related but is mutually non-intelligible. And there was an old lady there who was a very good storyteller. So she told me some stories and she told me the stories in her language. But one time she's telling me the story and I heard like a, like a ditty within the story that was in the Troban language. And it's like, oh, what did you just say? This is, this is Troban. And she said, I don't know. It's like, don't you know what, what you spoke? It's like, I just, you know, this is how I recall it. This is how I remember it. But I don't know if it's Trobian. I don't know if it comes from the Trobian Islands. And sometimes, like, it happened two times. She told me two stories that were in the Leech collection that she had no idea came from the Trobian Islands. So, you know, this is to give you a, like, a, like a slight idea of how these stories circulate in such a wide, you know, in such a wide form. So. Being like, like this would be like a like a project, like per se, like a, you know, like a like a self-standing project, so to speak. Try to map out, you know, like the origins of every single story and in, in the different places in the cooler ring that they reach. But I think for the time being, the preservation, you know, having an institution, you know, like the museum, who can who can preserve the stories and who can possibly in the near future keep this ongoing partnership and say sponsor a storytelling competition and generate not only more stories, but you know, like revive the interest for a practice that you know, is, is still very important in, in Trobian society. I think it's, very, um, it's something that they, you know, they're very keen to, you know, to, to keep on going.